Good morning or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Sanchita Saxena, and I'm the director of the Shubir and Malini Choudhury Center for Bangladesh Studies and the executive director of the Institute for South Asia Studies, where the center is housed. The Institute for South Asia Studies at UC Berkeley has always had a deep commitment to Bangladesh. But this has been even more pronounced with the establishment of the Choudhury Center in 2013. Through partnerships with leading institutions in Bangladesh, a vibrant lecture and conference series, and support of innovative research by graduate students, the Choudhury Center has galvanized debate on many key issues around the economic, societal, political, and environmental transformations facing the country. These are unprecedented times but we are committed now more than ever to bringing cutting edge research and scholarship about Bangladesh by leading experts in the field. Professor Malubika Sharkar is certainly one of those experts in the field of public health. Professor Sharkar is a professor and associate dean of the James P. Grant School of Public Health at Brack University in Bangladesh. As a mixed method specialist, Professor Sharkar also oversees the research activity and leads the Center of Excellence of Science and Implementation and Scale Up. Dr. Sharkar is a physician with a master's in public health from Harvard University and, and has a doctorate in public health from the University of Heidelberg in Germany. Her current scholarly interest lies in implementation and intervention research. She has published more than 75 articles in international peer reviewed journals and authored three book chapters. Professor Sharkar, along with Dr. Sabina Rashid, Dean of the School of Public Health at BRAC, who, and Dr. Rashid was also visiting scholar with us through the center, through the Choudhury Center, were both honored in 2018 as heroines of health for their work with vulnerable populations in Bangladesh by GE Healthcare and Women in Global Health. In an article about this honor, GE Healthcare wrote, in 2013, Sabina became the first woman to be appointed as Dean of the Brack James P. Grant School of Public Health, and Malubika is the first woman to serve as the school's director of research. The duo's collaboration is key to their leadership and is inspiring the next generation of global health workers. Their research has offered the world invaluable learning on topics such as community health workers, sexual and reproductive health, non-communicable disease, urban health, health systems, HIV, and beyond. Dr. Shirker's talk today is titled Implementation Research, a Catalyst for Bridging the Knowledge Gap Between Discovery to Delivery. Today's event is co-sponsored by the Center for Effective Global Action, the Masters of Development Practice Program, and the School of Public Health at UC Berkeley. So thank you again, Professor Sharker, and I'd like to welcome you to give your presentation. Thank you, Shanchita, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, so I'll start my presentation, but before the presentation, I just want to start with a story. And actually, uh, uh, the BRAC is the largest NGO in the world, and I started my career as a a junior uh, doctor as a physician in a rural village in Bangladesh. And um, the founder of Black, uh, late Sir Fozli Hassan Abed, I used to say that a small is beautiful, but big is necessary. And it's very much linked to actual implementation research. Um, and the center that I'm working on, uh, uh, the science of uh, implementation and scale up. And the story is that, that BRAC is very much known for its diarrhea uh, uh, disease, that oral um, uh, saline, that homemade saline that BRAC, uh, uh, the BRAC worker taught thousands of mothers in the village because that was one of the killer disease in the 80s. And when BRAC first started teaching, uh, the BRAC worker first started teaching the, uh, the mother, the rural mothers to uh, like how to make homemade saline and then so that it can actually save their kids from diarrheal diseases. And, um, and they found that the coverage is, was only 6%. And it was surprising because it's such a simple solution. 
and then why the mothers are not using it. And then they found out that actually the health workers who are teaching them, they don't believe in that. So they teach the mothers, but they themselves buy the medicine or go to doctors and don't feed the kids, the oral saline. So the, the, the point is that when we kind of have an intervention or product and we implement or execute that, and there's a lot of um, the challenges when we actually implement that and we don't pay attention to that. So with that story, I will start my uh, presentation. Um, let me start to share the screen. Um, so, um, so the title of my presentation today is the discovery to delivery and how can implementation research act as actually the catalyst. So uh, we know that the I always refer it as a pilot ideas. The globally, there are so many pilot intervention, and this is one of the like many examples of e-health intervention in Uganda. There are pilots after pilots and after pilots, and those pilots never see the daylight, or uh, they they are not possible to scale up or make it sustainable. And the reason is for that. We know that when there's an intervention, when we have a, we have a problem, that public health problem that we identify. Uh, so implementation can help the bridge the gap actually. And um, so whenever we have an intervention, the public health intervention, um, like, you know, historically in the beginning, we used to look at the health outcome, that whether there's a reduction of the mor morbidity, mortality, what about the daily adjusted life years or quality adjusted life years. Uh, the client's outcome, the satisfaction, um, the function. And then we realized that if we really want to measure that and we want to see that, uh, like, you know, it, uh, the health outcomes have been improved, we need to look at the service outcome. So the service outcome focused on the efficiency, the coverage, the global, we talk about the universal health coverage now, equity, the responsiveness between the health providers and the beneficiaries. So the more and more their interest in measuring and making sure that service outcome, uh, like, you know, that we can ensure the service outcome so that our health outcome will, will be improved. But still now they said not much attention to the implementation outcome. So the implementation outcome refers to the acceptability, adoption of the program, appropriateness, cost, feasibility, fidelity, actual, paper versus actual implementation, uh, the penetration of the services, the sustainability. So if you look at this flowchart, that actually if we fail to ensure the implementation outcome, that service outcome cannot be ensured, and then the health outcome will not be improved. And there comes the actually the implementation, the research, uh, where we can look at those implementation outcome and make sure that all those domains have been actually uh, successful. Um, so I just want to bring a key example from Bangladesh that my research work three examples uh, that uh, uh, we conducted the implementation research and how it helped uh, the, uh, the intervention outcome. Um, so the first project I'm going to talk about is the medical treatment loan. That's a very innovative um, intervention that BRAC came up with that uh, um, like, in, because this is very unique to give the medical treatment loan to the poor. Uh, before that, if we want to look at the context of Bangladesh, the current, um, the health expenditure is actually only 11%. And Bangladesh is one of the country, the out-of-pocket health expenditure is very, very high, the 72%. So any beneficiaries, they spend 72% or 72 taka out of 100 taka from out-of-pocket um, to receive the service. And the Bangladesh health system is very pluralistic. So we have the modern like medicine that we call allopathic, then we have traditional, um, there are a lot of informal providers, the quack doctors, the drug outlets. And um, so, but our, uh, the public sector is mostly the public sector run by the government, although it is free, but more and more population is very much kind of inclined to seek care from the private sector. And they spend a lot, and private sector is a, like there's a mushrooming growth. 
and each year, like in household, annually household trapped into poverty 3.4%. So like a half a million of like in a household trapped into poverty each year because of the out-of-pocket expenditure. So from that perspective that Brack decided that they found that they, that's microfinance borrower, those who actually receive the microcredit, the financial loan from Brack, um, there's a default. They can't pay back when they become sick because they have to pay for their treatment and uh, they can't work. So there are a lot of defaulter of those uh, microfinance borrower. So Black microfinance decided to the novel approach that how can we reduce this catastrophic health expenditure? And they came up with the idea that, okay, we should do this medical treatment loan. We offer this medical treatment loan, which is small loan offered to the microcredit clients when they are sick so that they don't have to, um, they can uh, seek care and become cured very quickly so that they can go back to work. Um, so we, uh, what we wanted to do a outcome evaluation with an implementation research component. So the question is that what is the effect of MTL in the financial aspect, but also um, is the implementation strategy uh, is that the correct one for poor coverage? Because even after such a nice program, it's a very innovative, very helpful for the poor, the coverage was very, very low. Very few actually microfinance borrower, um, they uh, come to BRAC whenever they're sick to kind of receive the, that loan. And so we, we did an um, implementation um, research like a quantitative and quality remix method. And in the beginning, what we found that there's a very poor awareness of the product. So the, the, the product is the how much money they will receive. What is the ceiling? Um, like, you know, um, how can they receive that uh, loan? Um, like it, it is very, very poor knowledge. And, um, and also they in BRAC introduced a very complex disease verification so that, that somebody have to go to the doctor and then have that prescription, the doctor have to be assigned by BRAC. So it's a very, very long process. And there's a high interest and very limited grace period. So later on, when we, we sat with the program, uh, like the colleagues, the microfinance colleagues, and then we have changed the, the, uh, the intervention. So the way we changed it to that, um, we referred it as MTL plus. So what we did, we have done a very, like the program started doing a marketing with a very clear message. And then any BRAC beneficiary can actually access that. Previously, it was only the existing microfinance borrower. Uh, the, the verification process that looking at the prescription and giving the money, uh, they made it very simple. Uh, the payback option, the multi. Um, so what happened that after, uh, addressing the implementation challenges, the, uh, the uh, total uptake has been actually substantially improved and the more borrowers started taking more money. Um, so the second uh, project I'm going to talk about is the, the boosting implementation. Again, another project uh, It's about entertainment education campaign. Um, so in Bangladesh, the child marriage is quite prevalent and uh, uh, the recent data has shown that those who are married uh, between 20 to 24 years that 59 percent of them actually got married before 18 years um, so th this is a really uh, kind of an epidemic and the government and other organizations are trying their best to address that and um, so from that perspective the unicef uh, came up with this intervention that in um, the tv series that's called the wing of desire uh, in bangladesh so this is a TV series that they were showing um, to show that this is a, the girls football team and then uh, inspiring the girls to continue the education and then to stop child marriage. So the objective was that through this entertainment education media campaign that they will change the social norms um, so that the child marriage can be um, like avoided. And um, so the project that we, I was working on that, so our uh, uh, like aim is to that, whether education entertainment campaign change the social norm against child marriage. And the second one is that whether the viewership adequate for changing the social norms. And the problem was that after UNICEF started, uh, like, you know, this uh, TV series, that we have realized that there are more than 100 TV channels in Bangladesh. 
and the most watched channels are Indian Zee, Bangla, and Star Jalsha. So the Bangladeshi channels are like actually only 10 to 15 percent the viewership. And these particular uh, TV series that UNICEF was showing, The Wing of Desire, although it was showing in multiple channels, uh, the viewership was very, very low. So then we introduced, because it's in like, you know, during the implementation, we identified that. And before evaluating that whether the social norms has changed or not, uh, we actually introduced a randomized control trial. And the question was that whether telephone reminder can in increase the viewership uh, of those, um, uh, the episode, the TV, channel, the, the TV shows. So what we have done, that was the RCT and in the first arm, uh, that uh, the population uh, that they received the phone call and SMS um, reminded in a week that uh, like, you know, you, you please watch that show that's at 8 p.m. And uh, we are showing that these, these, these three channels. The second um, uh, arm, they've only received three reminders every week. We have not actually made any phone call. And in the control, there was nothing. And after that, like, you know, uh, we found that the post-trial follow-up study that actually that overall the quality of the viewership have, have been significantly increased. And later on, when we did the evaluation, we found that uh, the, 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 uh, the target groups, the parents and adolescent boy and girls, their perspectives have changed actually after watching uh, that TV show. The final one quickly, that's the learn as you go design, another example of, of implementation research uh, like you know, we have done. Uh, it's about the vertical scale up. It's of the maternal child health that we wanted to expand the maternal child health that introducing more services. And um, so this was in actually in um, like in, uh, in Rohingya refugee that forcibly displaced Myanmar national, they refer as FDMN. And we know that there's a massive influx in August 2017, and uh, almost 1 million refugees were living in uh, Cox Bajar in the Rohingya camp. Um, and this is uh, like, you know, and um, so the UNICEF and other uh, organizations, they were uh, um, implementing maternal child health program. And then UNICEF wanted us to do some implementation research uh, to look at that what are the implementation challenges because uh, the, uh, the service utilization was not that much among the, the pregnant women and the child care, like, you know, the newborn child or uh, like, you know, uh, the, the mothers were not coming with the children for vaccination and others to the healthcare um, facilities, although it was accessible, available and free. So we have done an um, embedded implementation research. So I just want to kind of present that this type of embedded implementation research is is very much participatory. So implementation research itself is a participatory process. It's not the researchers ivory tower that researcher decides what to do. So they are we we like you know meet the stakeholders, the stakeholder workshop. We formulate the research question after discussing with our stakeholders. Then we conduct the research, the like you know collect the data and analyze it. Um, so through that, like you know, in the in, in Rohingya refugee. Uh, the project that we have learned that there needs to be more uh, coordination actually for medium and long term strategy because there's so many organizations are working and that created a challenge for executing because there are some overlapping and then not much communication um, like you know among the um, service providers and and also the capacity building of the managers and the health workers and the referral system is very important because the whole uh, the, the service was primarily focusing on the primary and the secondary care but for maternal care we also need a very good referral system okay so after all, all after this all these challenges even this today's presentation um, i just uh, want to share that so what we experienced so far um, so that for any solution of the problem, there is a proof of concept. We come up with a solution and we call it proof of concept. And that proof of concept actually most often we fail to deliver. Although there's the efficacy trial and the proof of concept is fantastic uh, when we did the uh, efficacy trial. Uh, but then we, when we want to scale up or kind of expand the program, we fail to deliver that proof of concept. And that because of the, the absence of a context 
target and resource specific implementation strategy, uh, which is very, very important. Uh, so the final the message is that the routine delivery of the proof of, proof of concept actually requires a formulation and test of real time implementation strategy. So we can actually generate a wonderful solution, which is very um, effective and efficacious. But if we really want to deliver it to the to our beneficiaries at the community level and expand it um, uh, and then scale it up and then make it sustainable, implementation strategy is very, very important because the context is different. The target group is different. The characteristic of the beneficiaries is different. Uh, the environment is different. The resource is different. So although it's the, it's the same product, we need to think about that. How can we make sure that uh, uh, like, you know, that uh, intervention or that product um, actually reach the community that we are in, uh, intended to serve. Um, so I, I, I actually, this is one of my favorite quote that if you think education is expensive, try ignorance. And it is actually attributed to A.P. Leder, a columnist uh, who wrote under the Ann Landers, uh, pseudonym in 1975. And uh, the reason I, 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 I actually very much I feel close kind of and my heart goes to this that if education is expensive try notice that same same actually is applicable goes to the implementation research or implementation strategy we invest so much um, to uh, identify a solution to generate a solution to come up with a fantastic intervention and do a lot of kind of an excellent uh, gold standard randomized control trial to see that does it work or not? And later on, we fail to deliver it to our community. So it's very important to focus on the implementation research. Thank you very much for listening to me and I apologize. I don't know what is the technology problem, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Shirker. I am now pleased to invite um, Dr. Bilal Siddiqui to respond to Dr. Sharkar's uh, presentation and moderate the question and answer session. Dr. Siddiqui is the Director of Research at the Center for Effective Global Action at UC Berkeley. His research interests lie in law and economics, political economy, and applied microeconomics, focusing specifically on the relationship between law, institutions, conflict, and development. He received his PhD and MPhil in economics from Oxford University, where he studied as a Rhodes Scholar. He has held positions at the World Bank, the Center on Democracy Development, the Rule of Law at Stanford University, and at the Institute for International Economic Studies at Stockholm University. Dr. Siddiqui. Thank you so much, Sanjuta, and thank you so much, Malavika, for um, a very engaging presentation that uh, was delivered, uh, as I understand, at between at uh, 11 p.m. in uh, Dhaka and with a uh, tremendous amount of energy, despite all of the all of the uh, uh, obstructions that uh, the internet threw at you. So thank you again for being uh, for being here and for giving us uh, your time. Um, so I had so many thoughts um, as you were as you were speaking and as I was seeing your presentation, um, and I was wondering maybe if we could uh, if I could just ask you a couple of questions and then maybe we can open up to Q and A uh, right after. So um, the first, I I love the way that you ended this, which is that which is something that we often hear being in the world of research. We often hear this uh, question from people who are in the world of policy or implementation. You're spending so much time and so much money on this research. You know, it's a waste of time. It's holding things back. What's what's the point? And I, I really liked the fact that the, 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 the idea that if we don't know this, we're actually spending, if we don't invest in the research and the knowledge, um, we're actually wasting all of that money. We could be wasting money on things that don't work. We could be not spending enough money on things that do work and, and so on. So maybe my first um, question to you, I guess, is that seems intuitive to me. It seems intuitive to you. We should know whether something works. 
what is the, uh, I'm an economist, so I'll say what, what is the market failure? Um, but more specifically, why is this not just the way that things should be, that things are done everywhere? Is it a matter of cost? Is it a matter of incentives? Is it a matter of people just not realizing this? Um, and by people, I mean, the, you know, um, people who are implementing policies, people everywhere from the NGO uh, field manager to the government sort of field officer to, you know, the people in charge. What, what do you think is the main um, constraint or blockage or hurdle that prevents everyone from doing this? It just seems like the most obvious thing to do. Um, that's, that's a very good question. Okay, I would say the three reasons. Um, so the first reason I'll start with that whenever we have an intervention, you know that we do this efficacy trial, randomized control trial. We really, really, really uh, kind of invest money and the researcher. So I think by automatically we think that we have done that, that our city design, the gold standard. So that intervention is perfect. So this is the product, it's like my iPhone and it's like, you know, uh, and it's the best product. And then the, the other two mistakes that we, we do that when we, we take it to the pop, like, you know, the beneficiaries of the community, our approach is very much top down approach. The two ways, one is that because we are confident, you know, that product, that intervention, fantastic, it worked, now I will go and implement that. The two major fundamental flaw that one is that we think that the provider or the service provider or community health worker, whoever that is, that the providers will train them and they will deliver it. We don't, we don't take it consideration that they have to adopt it. They have to accept it and only they can deliver it effectively and efficiently. So they, okay, we said that this is a very good, we have given you the training, now go and deliver the service. So we ignore those who are the, the service provider. We don't take, consider them. The second, we completely forget that, okay, this is a fantastic product, so the first thing. Second, I have trained my health worker, they are excellent, and now they will offer it to the community, and the community will accept is a kind of a, like a gospel or something that I, I will follow that. So we, we, then again, we ignore that this is a community, this is a, like there's a different culture, there's a different language, there's a different vocabulary, uh, there's different geography, like a simple example that I'll give you maybe a very silly example. Think about that maybe we have the malaria testing, maybe the rapid testing, that you can test it uh, like, you know, uh, rapid test. And then um, we introduce that in Bangladesh, maybe in the health facility, and we say to the water, like, you know, community, come, and then we'll test it immediately and give you the, the result. Then same program, I took it to Nepal and offered it the same way. But I do realize that because of the geographic concern that people might not come that with the fever. So my implementation strategy cannot be the facility based. It have to be the outreach and also the language and what, like, you know, so I, I think these are the three. One is that we take it's a gold standard. So it's done bill. Second is that health workers, because we train them, we don't have to pay attention to them. And the third is that we don't have to the, consider the context is different, the political economy is different, the language is different, the geography is different. So this kind of an, I would say the little bit of arrogance from our side. Are, are you suggesting that academics are arrogant? <laughs> I think that it's not the academic, we do the pilot testing, but it's the implementers. So I would say that uh, it's like an, I think uh, we don't value our customer. You think about that. You are in economics, you're talking about the market failure. Why if you go to the rural village, you will see that there's a Coca-Cola, but they don't, don't go for vaccination, they don't, don't eat carrot. Why? The Coke is bad. So because the corporate, I think one of the major failure of the public health is that we should take the corporate approach. I think the corporate, they pay more attention to the beneficiaries, the clients need, we, we don't. So I think that's a great point. I, uh, so I, I, I completely agree at some level, um, 
I have so many thoughts again on, on what you just said. So maybe I'll, I'll start with this. Um, I completely agree that there's, there's a lot that the public sector can learn from the, from the private sector. In the private sector, I've seen a lot of um, uh, people throw around this world word, uh, this phrase, uh, human-centered design or user-centered cent design. Um, and from my very limited understanding of, of implementation research, which I've mostly developed over the course of the last um, half an hour, um, there's, this, there's a difference in the focus, right? So the focus from of, of IR is more, um, more around the implementation mechanics per se from the beginning to the end. And the focus for on user-centered or human-centered design is more really starting perhaps from the, from the consumer, from the user and working backwards. But could you speak a little bit just for, our, our, just for clarity on how you see these two things? I did a little bit of Google searching as well and it seems like there isn't, active debate between the, the public health community uh, that's, that is, is focusing on one versus the other. So my understanding is they're not exactly the same, but I'm very curious to know what you think. Human-centered design, again, is becoming very fashionable nowadays. And uh, it makes sense. I would say that, like, you know, with respect to that, because the design, the program design needs to be the participatory. So what happened, again, like, you know, uh, like my experience and what I observe that when you do the human centered design, uh, we make it a participatory process. We bring the, our beneficiaries who wanted to know what is their need. And, but as you say, the delivery mechanism implementation strategy is not only of the clients, it's also about those who are delivering that. So it's about the, the providers. So the implementation, the strategy is, is, is it's a kind of an, it's a holistic approach. We need to think about the client's need definitely, but at the same time, I said like in the context, the geography, the social, political, the language, uh, the provider, the provider who will provide the service. And like, you know, when uh, uh, going back to the oral saline example that when Apitbhai has uh, seen that only 6%, the coverage and then uh, the health workers, they are not drinking the, uh, uh, oral saline uh, by themselves, he took them to ICD DRB and then he let them show that look at when you keep the saline, the patient improves. And the professor Richard Cash from Harvard University, he did that research and they actually witnessed the first hand. So, what happened that when we train, another example that I have done a study like a couple of years back, that giving the technology, the tablet to the health worker. And we gave the tablet, but we have not made them realize that why it is important. Why it is important, a tablet is important than the paper base. They, they were very happy, it's lighter, it's cool. But I think uh, the difference that in human-centered design is more like the intervention design, but a lot of, I would say that, uh, like I would say the dirty things, like you know, the logistic, the management, um, the health workers, the finance, everything has to bundle up there. So that's the, I, I see the distinction. And when we do the human-centered design, because delivery mechanism, we don't do the randomized control trial for delivery mechanism. We need to do that. It's not every interview. We need to show that which implementation strategy actually works better. And we never do that. So whenever we do that human-centered design, it's again about the product, not the delivery strategy or implementation strategy. So this is, uh, this is an excellent, I think, clarification for me, and I'm hoping for the audience as well. Um, maybe I can summarize what I'm, I'm hearing a little bit, just again for myself. So at some level, there's this point where you're trying to develop a product, right? And the product needs to be centered around users, around some, it has to have some utility, some usefulness, it needs to give people something they value. That's really when user-centered design or human-centered design comes in to create a good product. Um, then, and I'm using the marketing or private sector language precisely because um, of what you said earlier. Then there's the point where you want to see if that thing works, if it gives people that utility and so on. And that's when you do maybe a pilot and a, and a randomized control trial and you say, okay, let's try this out. And you find that it does work in this small scale. 
And so then the next step is really how do you expand that? How do you scale up? And that's, is that, if I'm understanding correctly, that is really when implementation research is at its, is, is the first and biggest thing that you really want to think about is how to scale a, a successful tested thing. Scale. I think when they, even if we do the effectiveness trial, it is good to have an like, you know, implementation strategy trial, but before scaling up, because you see that product does not need to be changed. If we give antenatal care to the pregnant mother or vaccination, the product doesn't need to be changed. But if you go to Bangladesh, you will see that the vaccination center is somebody's house in the village because of the accessibility, because the mothers don't go out with a small child. So your implementation strategy has been changed. You have to change your vaccine schedule. So that, but if I go to like in Nepal or if I go to coastal area, or if I go to humanitarian crisis, I need to think differently. So the problem is the same product is prescribed from, same product I'm going, I'm taking to different population, different context, and then I'm, I'm, I'm trying to deliver that in the same old way. And that's the failure, actually. That, that makes a, a, a lot of sense. So since this is a, supposed to be a conversation, I'm going to do a little bit of showing off in my one, uh, my one a bit of uh, work on, on public health, one of the things that sort of one of the studies I'm most kind of proud of, um, we worked in Sierra Leone, um, myself and, and a few co-authors, uh, co um, right around the time in 2011 when the government had rolled out a free healthcare uh, program nationwide. And the, you know, there was a lot of money going into the program, there was a lot of a lot of resources, a lot of donors. Everybody was excited about free healthcare, specifically for um, mothers, um, pregnant and lactating mothers, and uh, for children under five. Um, the biggest question that the Ministry of Health and some of the sort of development partners had was, okay, we're spending all of this money. You know, how do we incentivize health workers to actually? Um, implement, uh, not to put things in their pockets, not to um, sort of to show up on, uh, uh, on time and, and actually deliver the health services that are now being resourced. And uh, of course, the way they took it was uh, standard kind of financial incentives and giving pay raises and performance bonuses and so on. So my, uh, but what was interesting is the Ministry of Health said, look, this is not feasible as a long-term implementation strategy, we can't triple everyone's wages, we can't constantly monitor this. So are there cheaper and more effective ways to do this? And we tried a couple, um, and we did this uh, randomized trial um, across four out of the 13 districts in Sierra Leone, um, across all the health facilities. So there were maybe 250 health facilities. I know it's not compared to Bangladesh, but Sierra Leone is, is uh, for Sierra Leone, that was quite a large proportion of the, of the facilities. And the, the things that we wanted to look at were exactly these incentives, but from a different angle. And one of the things that we tried was providing a stronger, developing a stronger relationship of accountability between the communities themselves, the users, I guess, and the, um, and the healthcare workers. And the idea was that, look, the issue is not always going to be that healthcare workers are lazy or corrupt or incompetent, but that they're overworked, they, have, they feel demotivated, they try and do their best and then the community doesn't respond to them or they don't have the resources to do it or whatever. And as a result, they just kind of get despondent and so on. And anyway, I won't bore you with the, the details, but it basically involved um, going to the healthcare workers, asking them what they thought were the biggest constraints to healthcare, provision, uh, asking the community separately in a different meeting how, what they thought, then getting them to talk to each other, which is such a simple uh, difference in implementation, is that there were these healthcare workers who had been trained in the capital city in, in public health schools or whatever, and were now thrown in a, in a village and feeling alone and isolated and had a maybe antagonistic relationship with the community. And so anyway, the, the, we started these conversations they agreed on an action plan to actually implement uh, each of the, the, the things that they had discussed. 
Um, and then the NGOs we were working with, which included the International Rescue Committee and Concern uh, Worldwide and Plan International, um, with their local partners, basically visited the villages a few more times. And what we find, I forget now the exact numbers, but after a year of implementation of just this little meetings between the healthcare workers and the community, we found something along the lines of a 30 or uh, 25 to 30% decrease in infant mortality, in under five mortality. Um, and so thousands of lives kind of saved. Um, we found a increase in um, child weight for length. We found uh, health workers were more, more motivated, um, people were using the clinics more and so on. It was just these very small kind of changes in implementation. So, uh, and then later, in fact, when the Ebola crisis hit, we found big increases in Ebola, Ebola reporting. So um, communities, because they had developed this relationship with their healthcare providers, were now more likely to trust them um, in the context of an epidemic um, and to be able to report to those uh, to the healthcare workers. And even now, when you see what Sierra Leone is doing in the context of COVID, we see extremely low levels of uh, spread of COVID precisely because you know, these communities potentially have different relationships. All of that is a story making, I think, kind of responding to some of the points that you made, which is that RCTs and can be used, I think, to understand these basic questions of implementation. Your example right now with the SMS messaging um, for intervention, for example, showed uh, to me, or the reminders showed to me that this is a, a basic question of, of implementation, right? That you're actually addressing using the RCT's uh, approach as well. So at some level, I'm just wondering, do we think that these things are, are, um, are still separate or would it just be the natural next stage of RCTs and a lot of, at least in my field uh, in economics, because it's much more concerned with, in, with these incentives and, and institutions, essentially you end up, the, the field has moved from you know, a simple product to the actual delivery of that product. And I think more and more starting to, I think, understand the insights from this implementation research. So I'm wondering, do you think this is kind of the natural direction in public health as well, that public health um, schools and, and, um, and researchers get more involved with the actual implementation while still following the gold standard approach of the RCTs? Um, there's, you know, researchers in Bangladesh, in uh, India, elsewhere, who are trying to do RCTs at scale with local governments. So rather than doing a small pilot, actually expand the research, the, the control, uh, control design across the entire uh, state, for example, um, or, or whatever. In, are, is that the natural direction in which this goes? Or do you think there'll always be a, a, a tension between these? I think implementation research is a very uh, new emerging field, I think. And the global level, like, you know, I know most of the implementation researchers globally. Uh, and uh, whenever we have a discussion, we actually, I think we are going towards that direction. And one of my, I think that I strongly believe that we have to include the implementation research as a part of monitoring and impact evaluation, the framework. Uh, because, uh, like, you know, we look at the impact, but we need to use the randomized control trial design to look at different strategy. And, like, you know, one of the example, like, you know, in the COVID, I suggested that BRAC, but uh, <laughs> somehow with the time, they did not agree that they, they have this plan to, for community engagement, that engaging the community leaders so that they can uh, spread the message of the safety and the protective. And I told them, can I do an RCT that some of the sub district will engage the community leaders, some maybe young adult to see that whose contribution is actually the value for money, the contribution is worthwhile. And I understand as implementers said, no, we can't do that. We have to change everybody. But I said at the end, after six district, when you will scale up 64 district, who would you focus? Is it the young people? Is it the community leaders? Is the local government? So definitely there's a discussion and I'm hopeful that uh, there is a convergence with our randomized control trial implementation research and the impact evaluation. So 
I do think that I used to do a lot of evaluation, still do, but there's a convergence. And I think more and more economists like you, if you join us, then that will be fantastic. I, I'm, I'm ready to serve when called upon. <laughs> Um, so, uh, you gave this really good example just right now about the malaria, malaria rapid testing, right? And I think that that's, again, fascinating um, and so relevant, not just on the malaria side, but right now everyone's obviously thinking about COVID and everyone's thinking about testing, everyone is thinking about vaccine delivery once the vaccines hit. What are the, some of the insights from your work on the malaria testing from implementation research more generally about how to expand um, testing and take up of testing across, let's say Bangladesh or around the world, but let, we can start with Bangladesh since that's uh, the most relevant. Are you referring to COVID testing or malaria? To COVID testing, exactly. So what are the insights? Are there insights that you can apply to COVID testing and to potentially to the take up and adoption of vac vaccines? I'm from Pakistan. We, um, I don't know how, how familiar you are for, with the, our extremely um, complicated relationship with vaccines, but there was this whole point, I won't go into the, uh, into the political economy of it all, but when polio, uh, when, vac when doctor, a particular doctor was used to kind of provide intelligence, it discredited the entire vaccine industry and it led to the resurgence of polio because people in um, one entire province started thinking that polio vaccinators were basically uh, American spies. <laughs> and so as a result, I mean, Pakistan and Nigeria were the only two countries in the world where suddenly polio cases were going up. So my question, I think, is that, you know, there are lots of trust issues around testing, around vaccination um, or, or anything, anything that um, outsiders want to do with your body. Um, and, um, and I'm I'm curious to know how one can take insights from implementation research to, to improve this. Uh... In terms of vaccination in Bangladesh, I would say that we are, we are one of the exemplary country because the trust on vaccination is very high. If you look at our immunization coverage, it's 90%. And that's where our child mortality has been like, you know, substantially reduced. So that, that, there is a trust on vaccine. That's not an issue. The COVID is interesting in Bangladesh because in the beginning when the community were very keen for testing, the testing was very expensive. We used to charge $40, $50. And then they wanted. Now, like, you know, in November, I know that their government and others, development partners, they are trying to kind of make accessible the testing, uh, but people are not interested in testing because the COVID, like, I think the COVID phobia has been kind of an gone in Bangladesh. If you go, you see that uh, 80 to 90 percent, they don't wear masks. And then, so there is this, no, they're not afraid of COVID anymore. So, so that's a different issue, I think, because I think if the test is accessible, the first thing I have to accept that I want to do the testing. So if they think there is the mild symptom moderate and it goes away, they'll not go for testing. Regarding the vaccine, I do have, and you know that I don't want to open the Pandora's box about the Pfizer, Pfizer vaccine, which is two dose and minus 70 degree refrigerator, which has a lot of implementation uh, um, uh, challenges. And I will be actually in another uh, panel next week with the Nobel laureate, the HPV vaccine, uh, invented Nobel laureate to discuss about the vaccine. But to me, the concern is that going back to the implementation research that I'm really, my concern is not about the COVID vaccine. My concern or the safety, my concern is the disruption of the routine vaccine because of the COVID vaccine. Given that the, our health infrastructure, given that our resources, our population, uh, my concern is that when the COVID vaccine will come, whether that will actually disrupt our routine vaccination program because the priority changes and everything changes. So that's my biggest concern now for a country like Bangladesh. So I know that um, uh, BRAC, is, uh, BRAC University is obviously close, still closely affiliated with, with BRAC yeah, yeah. organization. I, I know it's not the same, but, um, but I, I know you're also familiar with, with BRAC's operations. Um, a little bit about what I know um, in previous kind of interaction with BRAC, 
there's this huge sort of um, program of community health workers that they they implement. Uh, the Shakti Ashwabikas, I think, is is the name. And basically, the idea there is that you have these community health workers constantly going to villages, developing these relationships of trust, and they're also at some level the points of contact for specific health uh, delivery. I'm wondering, to that end, is that the, the, the way forward is to, at some level, it seems to me that implementation research really is a way of also taking, as you said, the context into account. And that context might vary tremendously from place to place. Um, top down, it, um, sort of implementation really sets itself up at some level for, for failure. So do we now see a future where, given how much um, variation there is going to be constantly at the local level, that um, governments should be working increasingly with decentralized, um, traditional, or more accepted sort of um, delivery uh, mechanisms at the local level? And is the era of kind of you know, command and control at some level I, I hate to use that term, but is the era of you know a top-down concerted effort to push out um, public health interventions um, harder to implement nowadays? Uh, and I, and the reason I'm thinking about this is also because how information has changed. So I think previously in before WhatsApp and before the wide proliferation of the internet and the rise of conspiracy theories and fake news and whatever it is, it was easier to deliver a coherent message because people had more trust, perhaps in experts, they had more trust in the government. And I'm speaking very generally here, of course, this varies a lot. Um, and now for everything that one person says, there's a WhatsApp group that is dedicated to, to casting doubt on what the government is really trying to do or what the public health workers really trying to do. And I'm wondering how, how one should think again about implementation in, a, in this kind of very changing um, information context and in a context where local information in particular seems to be getting more and more um, relevant and more and more powerful. Um, so Bangladesh, the public sector, the government is actually more responsible for the clinical care. And the community mobilization was done by organization like BRAC. BRAC was not in kind of an, like, of course, antenatal care, more like primary health care, not secondary tertiary health care. Um, so in Bangladesh, I've said that, that like, it's like a digital age. And in Bangladesh, more than 90% household have access to mobile phone. Uh, the 60% is the smartphone user. And government is, and also the BRAC organizations really trying to bring technology to the community health worker because that's very important. And uh, our health program actually decentralized. I think in Bangladesh, uh, like you know, often we think that our health program government is not centralized is only in terms of the finance and the uh, kind of hiring and then human resource. But in terms of the service delivery is very much decentralized. It's the civil surgeon at the district level, Upojala health family planning officer, the Upojala level, the subject that they offer the services. So, um, but what Bangladesh needs because of the NCD and COVID, we do need what we needed in 80s, that this community mobilization by the community health worker. And for NCD, non-communicable disease, and this uh, pandemic preparedness, I think we should 2020 again, I think ask for that kind of model, but not maybe the Shastra Shibik Asia, the BRAC Shastra a little bit more educated, more lady doctor, like, you know, um, is in Pakistan that you have this lady, lady doctor, is it? Like, yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. Level. So it's more like, you know, it, like educated, but uh, of course that there have to be, I would not say the decentralization only, but also very much focus oriented and more coordination, not the vertical approach, because we see the diabetes and tuberculosis together. We see the COVID and uh, uh, because of the hypertension or diabetes. So it's more complex now. So we need more coordination. We need an excellent health information system from the bottom up so that this pandemic preparedness or we can take immediate steps. So 
decentralization, but as well as uh, use of technology, engaging community, um, like you know, um, building a community kind of model, community health worker, uh, more trained and more coordination. Yeah, so I think that's the way to go. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm going to quickly ask the audience um, if they have additional questions. Uh, and while we're waiting, I'm going to uh, ask one more because I'm very glad. So if you have additional questions, please uh, submit to the Q&A box, uh, submit on Facebook. Uh, we're watching that uh, flow as well. Um, submit, to, uh, submit to either of those and we'll, we'll raise them. Um, but while, while we're waiting for that, so I'm very glad you brought up the health information system because I think that's another sort of huge source of information, not just about the current um, situation, particularly whether it's uh, prevalence rates or, or areas of, um, of concern or hotspots, uh, et cetera. But, uh, but it also gives a lot of insight into implementation failures. Um, I, I, and I'm curious to know a little bit about from your experience, to what extent are um, administrative data systems um, more generally um, health information systems um, and so on. Firstly, to what extent are they used for diagnostic approaches to implementation versus simply a sense of, you know, this district is doing better than this, we should send in more, you know, resources or whatever. I, my experience of working with these systems is that the amount of data collected relative to the amount of data that is ever seen is just completely um, miles apart. Um, ultimately, every, um, every policy uh, sort of intervention that seeks to build up the IT system of a, of a, um, uh, of, of a ministry or a department tends to cre end up with the dashboard, which is great because it's useful, but the dashboard takes four indicators and uses those. And then those are the only ones that are used for performance. Uh, payments, and those are the only ones that are used for uh, delivery decisions, whereas there's so much more information that is captured in just regular data processing um, that I feel never sees the light of day to the extent that I've often been to um, see the system and I said, oh, here's a nice little interesting statistic and the government, for, like the minister in charge will say, I had no idea this was the case. Why have we not known this before? And like, it's where did you get this information? And like, it's from your data system. So I'm curious again, Bangladesh being an outlier in terms of how 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 well it does things uh, on the service delivery front. To what extent do you feel like these data systems are act adequately used? How would you think about making them more useful for uh, understanding implementation? Well, again, the cyber approach. So what happened in Bangladesh as a digital Bangladesh? we started giving the laptop and then uh, the computer or the health facility. And then we have excellent DIHS too, uh, District Information Health System too, that collects all this data. But the problem is again, again, the threefold. One is that we started this health information, um, uh, uh, I would say the revolution in Bangladesh, like, you know, really good, but it's very much vertical approach. There is no connection with the provider. So the physicians, they are not interested in the data. They are more interested in kind of a patient will come, I will serve, I'll give my the best. Then the frontline health worker who collect the data, they are not trained to look at the data and the data, analyze the data. So what happened, there are a lot of data. We have an excellent kind of management information, the national level, the regional level. But if you see the utility of the data, because data is for decision making, data is for my changing, my shifting, my strategy, like, you know, and approach, that's huge lack. And here I would say that we have this technocrat, those are the data scientists, then we have the physicians, then we have the frontline health workers. And I think we need to bring all of them together on the same platform. And also, like, you know, um, kind of an awareness of the why data is important to make the doctors understand that how the data will help their decision making, make the even the, uh, the community health worker understand why that is important, how many pregnant women come. She can easily say, oh, last month 20, now 15. Why are those five women? 
So I think there need to be again. Uh, somehow we are becoming, you know, sub 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 specialist in every field. So I think we need to bring uh, all of them together because health information system. I would say the last ten years is really amazing. If you go to Ghana, like you know, different countries, even the Sierra Leone, I know, like you know, Tanzania, the Bangladesh, or India, but we have failed to bring the health providers on board to kind of train them, to educate them, to make them aware, to give the tool to you, you uh, to use that data. So all data at the central level, and then at the end of the year, you have a, a very nice graph and bar, but day to day, it's not, there's not much utility, yeah. Yeah, I really like that point. It's very um, interesting, just from the study that I was giving the example of in, in Sierra Leone, uh, you know, we had essentially, if you think about it, two two things going on. There was, we we sat with the communities and made them talk to the to the nurses and vice versa. And these were, you know, public sector um, employees that they were talking to for the first time in a systematic way. But the the way we started the conversation was literally we took data from the clinics, um, just simple statistics about maternal mortality, child mortality. Oh vaccinations uh, delivered, et cetera. And we summarized them in a chart, um, in a few charts. And we said, look, here is how your clinic is doing. Here is how other clinics around Sierra Leone are doing. Here's how clinics in your district are doing. Now you have this information. Tell us why you think your clinic is doing worse on, on malaria um, uh, you know, prevalence or uh, uh, malaria-related uh, uh, mortality. And, um, and again, talking about RCTs, the researchers in, um, from, uh, from uh, Stockholm who actually uh, did this in Uganda and they split these two things. So they looked at this full intervention and then they looked at the part of the intervention that just involved the community meetings. And they found that the ones with just the community meetings with the nurse nothing really changes or they have, it has much fewer, low, lower impact. Whereas the ones with where there's the information that starts off um, people, um, the starts off the discussion, it suddenly focuses people on the key indicators. Um, it gets them excited and it gives them a base of information from which to argue. Otherwise the nurse will be very tempted to say there's no problem. And the community will be very tempted to say everything is a problem. And no, or or you know, if your shame and and uh, pride uh, intervene, the community will also say there's no problem. So putting the data up front and center and saying, look, here's the problem. Now let's talk about what what why the problem is there and what the solution might be. I think that's a really really key point um, as well. But, but also we need to actually fit it into the medical curriculum and the nursing curriculum and the. Health, the health information, that's actually missing. So suddenly you cannot expect a postgraduate doctor to understand the data and think about the data analysis. So it needs to be kind of in, you know, the curriculum uh, change. There have to be change in curriculum, the medical curriculum and nursing curriculum. Yeah. Absolutely. Many... Um, so um, just uh, wanted to flag, so there's a, a question on Facebook actually from Zakia Afreen. Um, Zakia asks uh, about, uh, from your earlier presentation, she's asking, how is the success of the UNICEF effort to reduce child marriages measured? How did they measure the success? Um, and then she's also asking, did the rate of such marriages go down in the next six months or year? And also were the same people surveyed back to find out whether they lived uh, the learning? Uh, whether they actually uh, practice this. So the outcome that we looked at, the outcome indicator was not the reduction of child marriage because the child marriage is very much complex. What we wanted to see, we wanted to see that whether social norms have been changed, whether the parents feel that, that girls should continue their education, uh, they should not get married and actually uh, like, you know, uh, there should be income generation. So it was all about the social norms and then they are willing to stop child marriage and willing not to. So, so we have not looked at the reduction of child marriage actually as an outcome indicator. 
we only looked at the perception that changes in social norms and it was a panel survey so we have seen that there are some changes but again i'm like you know i, I would be very cautious to say that attributed to that particular episode and the tv episode uh, because we, this one year is a long time even in bangladesh setting and a lot of uh, like you know campaign against child marriage so first of all that we have not looked at the child marriage it was all about the social norms and the secondly it was the panel data so we have been able to see that whether there's a changes in the the parents and also the adolescent children at home that way that their uh, perception have changed or social norms yeah that's uh, that's really good to know and uh, from my again limited um, experience in Liberia, in uh, the, the information that I, the, the work that I know from Kenya and so on, there's so much of a role that just simple um, information and uh, acceptance that this is not just information, but that other people do it, my role models do it, uh, TV stars, you know, behave differently, um, whether it's about um, sort of uh, sexual behavior, um, and and um, uh, the use of um, of uh, contraceptives, whether it's about sugar daddies in Kenya, which is just you know young women finding uh, there's a norm uh, there was a norm about um, finding sort of rich older men um, and just simple information about this and its impact on uh, prevalence of of STDs and STIs was uh, sufficient to change a lot of people's behavior and so on. So I think there's a lot of role, um, even in this kind of context, to think about what is the specific kind of behavioral, normative, aspirational sort of things that are actually in play here, uh, quite apart from just like delivering, um, delivering this uh, norm change in a, in a top-down sort of way. Um, so I know this is extremely late. I want to say it's somewhere like 12.20 your time, am I right? <laughs> So, because I don't see that many questions, but I, I'm glad that we discussed the implementation research because I think there should be more awareness about the implementation research and try to understand uh, the implementation. So hopefully, I don't know how many have been listening, but I think um, it's very important to spread the news that- uh, our Absolutely, so I was actually gonna ask you, and maybe you've already done this, but kind of as, as, uh, as a closing, where would you like things to go from here? What are, as, a, as, a, as someone who thinks about implementation research a lot, um, how would you apply it, your, how, how would you like your next set of actions to be, or how would you like implementation research to be wide, more widely implemented? How can uh, your partners in this space, whether it's UC Berkeley and the kind of broader research community, whether it's BRAC and, and the like, the, the actual implementers, how would you think about um, expanding this more generally? What are the concrete things that, uh, actions you would like um, to support you from your partners? Um, um, yeah, I mean, what, what should we take away as, as, our, as our concrete next steps um, from your talk? Um, okay, before that, I just want to say that what I want to see in terms of the implementation research future, then, like whenever a policymaker or any uh, organization like BRAC decides to uh, uh, start an intervention for the population, I would like to see that before that they should have an anonymous control trial, trial for the implementation strategy. Of course, that intervention they will like, you know, uh, offer that. So that's one of my kind of, and I would say that I would like to see that globally more that uh, so that there will be really um, a less wastage of the resource and also the time. And the secondly, in terms of the partnership, I think like, you know, um, as an implemented research, I'm working with like many of my global colleagues and we, uh, with like Johns Hopkins and we uh, developed implementation research course so that that can be offered uh, to the students. And we also have actually developed a MOOC which is at actually Hopkins website and I also teach. Um, so that's the one way to the kind of an uh, capacity building or awareness of the implementation, um, like on research that, 
And secondly, in terms of the partnership, I would say that um, we are very open as a school of public health to kind of a uh, partnership for doing any kind of research that whether we can um, joint it as an impact evaluation. If you're doing an impact evaluation, then like, you know, like adding a kind of implementation research component to that, even when you do the effectiveness trial, that how the strategy is working when we see, want to see that whether the product has worked or not. Um, and uh, yeah, I think more this type of exchange and bringing the young people, like, you know, I would like to see that if the Choudhury Center can organize and more kind of, a, not the panel, but bringing young mind from Berkeley and uh, discuss that, what do they understand of the implementation intervention? Even for COVID testing, uh, like, you know, vaccine, you need to implement that in different country setting. And America has shown that how failure it is of the, the, the best country to deliver the service. So I think implementation is you have the best doctor, you have the best uh, technology, best diagnostic center, best infrastructure, but the whole delivery mechanism, it has failed. So I do think that it's very important. I don't want to limit the implementation research, but I think we need to look through the lens of implementation that is not it's not enough to have the resource. It's not enough to have an excellent solution. It's not enough to have a very trained worker. It's not enough to have a super infrastructure. You need to think carefully about the implementation. And the COVID has shown that. The small countries like Vietnam has been successful. Sierra Leone has been successful. While like, you know, America struggled, Italy struggled, France is struggling. So I, I think this is the best time now, better than ever, to think about implementation more, actually. Yes, I, I, there was this, this is a, a terrific point. I'm glad you drew the, the comparison. There was a moment, I think somebody posted on Twitter that there are currently more cases in the White House than there are in the countries of Vietnam and New Zealand uh, combined. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a good moment of reflection about how, how terrible implementation of any Kind of public policy can go um, if you if you don't have your fundamentals right. So um, thank you so much. Um, this was enlightening for me. I'm sure it was enlightening for the audience. I know there's plenty of people signed in from um, I think across the world, including in your time zone. So to the extent that you have uh, avid listeners, um, I'm I'm very um, you know I'm I'm completely unsurprised and I'm very uh, grateful to the audience also for putting up with the, the, the various tech failures and the timing and all of that. And I'm glad that you are still here listening. Um, thank you so much from, from me. And I want to invite uh, Sanchita to come and, and um, also thank you on behalf of the Institute and, and UC Berkeley. So Sanchita, thank over you. to you. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you, Professor Sharker, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you, Dr. Siddiqui, for a wonderful engagement and conversation. I think we all learned so much. Thank you to the audience for listening and participating. Um, this the event will be online. So if you if you were not able to be with us today, you'll be able to view the event later. And thank you, uh, Professor Sharkar, for sort of giving us possibilities. Um, even thinking about collaborations. You know, the Chaudhary Center has had a long history. I mean, since its inception, of long you know fruitful partnerships with Brack University and and Brack NGO. Uh, in fact, Abid Bhai actually uh, inaugurated our center. Um, so we remember him quite fondly. So I uh, look forward to future collaborations and I hope to at some point visit Bangladesh once again, once we, you know, these restrictions um, are lifted. So thank you again. And thank you again for staying up so late. I, I realize it's so late for you, but thank you both. Thank you. Special thanks and all this. I think that was wonderful for me to go through this implementation challenges, like, you know, delivering and this kind of reconnected. That reminds me that I think it reminds all of us how important this discussion is. Absolutely. So, thank you, Shantita. Thank you, Punita. And thank you, Bilal. I know you by name. So it's lovely to meet you in person and have a wonderful discussion. And I want to continue that, like a long Abda. So <laughs> long. thank you. Hopefully in person at some point, yes. <laughs> you get what you wish for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. And my attitude to 
uh, Shubin and Malin centers. For Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you and, and good night <laughs> to you. Thank you.